Caltex, I guess in America. And I am so blessed to count him as my friend, as well as Lucy. But you have no idea what Keter means to me, Lucy. Bless the Lord. And a lot, a lot of things we do we couldn't do without Keter. It's true. It's true. And a lot, a lot of things Lucy does she couldn't do without Keter. Right, Jesus and Keter, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Keter. Bless the Lord, Lucy. You know Lucy. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We exalt thee. Oh, Jesus, you're so exalted today. Oh, we lift you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to your name forever. Thank you, Jesus, for your power on all of these people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the having a meeting, get in this river and flow on and worship and move on out to some places in God and take care of some things and praise God. But I believe God wants to say some things to us this morning first, do some things, we'll see. And so you may be seated and I'm going to need you later too, so be sitting by. You know, I traveled in ministry with Vicki Jameson Peterson for nine years. And so to have Sharon here, uh, Sharon, of course, was on the road with Vicki for how many years? About 28 altogether. About 28 years Sharon played. And then we, of course, have Judy up, John, right here that traveled with her. It, how long were you with Vicki? Since she started, since Vicki started, well... Vicki went home to be with the Lord 
in January a couple of years ago. And, you know, when she went, she left all that God deposited in her, on her, with her. When she left, all of it just dropped down into the earth on all of us. And so it's still a blessing, Sharon, such a blessing to just hear and flow in that, again, praise God. I um, actually have been on the mission field, vive la France in the first row. Uh, I have been on the, on the mission field uh, and um, I see Pastor Paul Brady from Ireland. Blessings to you and your wonderful wife. And I know uh, John Rood, I think uh, John Rood has left. I, I, I think he did. Yeah, I think he did. But um, all of you people from, who came from, who, who came from other countries of the world here to this meeting? Stand up. We want to see you. Glory to Jesus. Well, we know the Aussies are here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. And we are believing God that he's going to do marvelous things for you to take back with your, to your country, uh, mainly awaken your, your nation and that you've been imparted to in this meeting and, and, to, uh, and gotten some equipment that will help you in the future. Hallelujah. So we're going to begin this morning. I've been on the mission field for uh, about nine years, I think now, since Vicky went home to be with the Lord, and Sharon has not uh, not been with me, but uh, twice, uh, twice or three times. So it's just a blessing, and thank you. There's an anointing on Sharon that is just incredible to bring the presence of the Lord. So we're going to open our Bibles to this morning to Jude to the book of Jude, and in case you don't read the book of Jude every day, you might know that, or you didn't go to Ramah or whatever. Jude is by revelations after, after John, First John, and it's a small book written by Jesus' brother. But every time I prayed about this message, actually today, and even weeks ago, the anointing of God would come as I prayed in anticip- as, 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 I, as I prayed about the meeting, it, God, the anointing would come in anticipation of what God wants to do here today. Isn't that incredible and amazing? Isn't it amazing that God would be so looking forward to a group of meetings or a place where his people were, were operating that in advance he would just show up waiting for us to be here. Glory to God. Before we read in, in Jude, the third verse, um, years ago, um, I'm, I'm going to tell you two stories back to back, two stories unrelated, and you're gonna have to remember them. You can do that, can't you? Good. Years ago, uh, I saw uh, Wendy Ellis yesterday over here at the, in the altar, at the, in the, at the altar. Where, where are you? Hold your hand up, wave at me. Where is she? There she is, stand up. Wendy is married to David Ellis, and they pastor in California now. Isn't she beautiful, and inside and out? And, uh, but anyway, David, before he married Wendy, he, uh, he worked with us in our church in Montgomery. And we had a singing group. And we had to sing in the singing group for everything because we were the only people to sing. Basically, the reason I sang was because I had to sing. And, you know, I, I'm not a singer. I can tell you I sing, but... I, I, I wouldn't be classified as one of those people that would be, you know, uh, group savvy. Let's just put it that way. But anyway, we sang every week and we sang for every event. And one time we had this event in our church and um, 
we had this uh, special song we got up and we did it a cappella. And so there was four of us. And so, you know, the parts had to move. I mean, it was, you know, if you're into moving parts and all those kind of things, it, it was kind of neat. It had four parts, it moved back, but, and we sang a cappella. And uh, I can actually still remember it like a nightmare. <laughs> you know how, how that, <laughs> okay. Now, uh, let me just tell you this in case you don't know any Wendy Ellis about your husband. We, we did have some nightmares. <laughs> but he was quick to correct. Anyway, um, I, it was a beautiful song, actually, and we were singing it for an event. And so half the song was a cappella. And then he came in, you know, with the, with the piano. And it, it was awesome, actually. Uh, it, it, the, when he came in with the piano, it kind of darkened it, you know, the second half, made it go up, and it became more dramatic. And so it was really, you know, quite nice in practice. <laughs> I'm glad you got that. <laughs> but let me tell you, you were not there. <laughs> if, you, if you had been there, you would have really gotten it. Hallelujah. <laughs> so... <clears throat> What happened was, um, when we did the real thing, the, uh, when the piano came in, David playing the piano, um, and he was the instrument. We didn't have other instruments. I mean, you know, most people do in their church, but this is a small church. Somehow, all of us that were singing, we had... Gra graduated either, I don't know what, up or down or, you know, somewhere out in the ethers to another key. <laughs> we were singing a cappella, all the, vo the vocals, and we were just doing great. And then everything slumped. <laughs> and, um, but the point is, we were all in tune with each other. <laughs> But simultaneously, in unison, we went <laughs> flat. And really, actually, no one would have known if we had left out the instrument. <laughs> but the instrument was not left out. And David came in, and we were over here on another key, and he came in immediately, of course, he corrected it. He, he did a great job. <laughs> but so the instrument was playing in one note. <laughs> oh, it was such a train wreck. I, I can't even <laughs> tell you. And I got to thinking about this because it was all wrong. All of us were wrong. But we were all in tune with each other. There was actually a true pitch, not up high or anything, but it was a note that we were supposed to be on that came out in the note, you know, in the song for everyone to, to give comparison to and everything. And when he hit the note, it exposed the truth. <laughs> the true pitch, you know, it never changed. But who changed? We did. We changed. <laughs> Consequently, we changed it. So, but I want you to keep that little story in mind and we'll be coming back to it. Another kind of example of this, I want you to see to, about this today is um, uh, before I went on my last trip overseas, which, which was about a month ago, three weeks, I guess. Oh, it couldn't have been that <laughs> soon. Anyway, about a month ago, uh, we, we bought a house, built a house by a lake in uh, Montgomery County, the largest lake in Montgomery County, beautiful, a couple of years ago and moved in. And so I was um, walking at night out by the lake and the stars were just gorgeous. I mean, it, it, it's real dark out there because there's not a lot of street lights. And so I looked up and... 
the sky and I was walking and it was, there was not a lot of humidity and so everything was clear except for, you know, a few clouds around. And I looked up and I thought I saw a, a, a formation of airplanes in the air just flying like fighter jets flying along uh, way up in the sky and we do have two military bases and this is the, uh, around our thing you know house uh, not around there but in the area but the only place I usually see military planes is in Israel <laughs> and then you know you just kind of prepare for it I was like wow I mean are we having you know a war or has somebody attacked or whatever and so they were flying close together and I thought they're doing exercises and, and they looked like some lights just moving across the sky. And I thought, this is amazing. What is going on? And so I just kept wa uh, watching and the longer I watched, I came to know that these really were not airplanes because they stayed in the same place in the sky. They were just, um, they, they, de they never went out of sight. And so... I looked, you know, a little bit closer. Now, this is me. This probably wouldn't have been you, but, but this is me. And I, the closer I looked, I saw that what I was looking at was stars. Not airplanes, but stars. And what was moving and gave the sensation of planes moving across the sky were the clouds that were in between the stars and me. And I got to thinking about it. And I thought, this is the way we, we judge God. By the clouds that are moving, by things that can move, we judge somebody that cannot be moved. Now, if you, if you were in a ship, you know, and you were out at sea, you definitely would not navigate by the clouds. You, you would navigate by something that does not move. You would navigate by something that uh, is anchored, immovable, and stationary. And so our lives are the same way. They have to be anchored. Uh, uh, we have to have our, our lives moved. We have to move by the anchor of God and solidly and uh, immovable. That's the way we have to move. Now, we live in a world today and you as the body of Christ, everything can change. Click, just like that. And, you know, even our pitch in our song, it slipped off the perfect note really quick and it definitely changed everything. It was no longer an event, it was a disaster, <laughs> just for a few moments. There is only one thing that never changes. There is only one thing that cannot change. And I know that you know this, and it is our God. And he is eternally the same, eternally the same. And uh, I, the reason I'm saying this is because, you know, we've been here in this wonderful atmosphere of prayer and the spirit's moving, real corporate anointing, um, um, amazing ministry gifts. And, you know, it, it's just been awesome. And, and right now we, we have faith that when we get home, bless God, bless God, bless God. I am going to see the Holy Ghost moving in on a cloud and the hardest cases in my town, they're gonna be slayed over by the power of God. Yes, sir. <laughs> and then, that's going to become the time when you're going to have to realize God never changes. And what I believed in that meeting, even though what I got home and saw wasn't exactly like it, close, I'm still believing him. 
I tell you, I, I was in, when I was in Paris, we rode around in this car. We always <laughs> drive around at night in cars, you know, in a car, or this, in this case, a car. And we always go to the Eiffel Tower because this time I was in Paris because it's so beautiful at night. And I was thinking about, uh, actually, I was thinking about this when we were walking. There are some amazing buildings in Europe, aren't they? Some, uh, they are built thousands of years ago, some of them, hundreds. I'm thinking about Notre Dame right now. But um, they're still there, all those buildings. They're really old. They're there. But they're, they're worn and, you know, they're, they're altered, you know, by weather. And I, I, this occurred to me. The hardest of substances in some weather, you know, and some pressure, they're going to be changed and altered. Because they have like some, I've been places, uh, actually in Italy, where you can still see the bullets in some of the buildings fr from the war. But there's something so wonderful about our God. And the Bible calls him the ancient of days. And I, I would look around at those buildings and I would think, wow, you, you could hardly, get, I mean, you can just tell when you see them, especially like Belgium. These are some old buildings. I mean, it's, it's almost darkness. It's, they're so old. They're, they're also dark, dark, there's also darkness there, but you know. God moves in darkness, so that's where he first moved. The, the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and said, and it couldn't have been darker that day than it is in Europe right now, so whatever. But these buildings, you know, they, over the years, you know, they, they get pounded by weather and wars and everything, but there's so, something so wonderful about our God and as I said, the Bible calls him the ancient of days. Even though there's been all kinds of weather and situations and wars and every other kind of thing you can think of, he has never been off key. He has never decomposed. He has never changed. He has never become something else. He is the same as he was from the beginning and will be eternally the same. Glory to God. So now we're going to read in, in Jude, the third verse. Beloved, my whole concern was to write to you in regard to our common salvation. And so in verse 3, he's, he's saying he, he intended to write about their salvation. But, and I'm reading out of the Amplified. But I found it necessary and was impelled to write you and urgently appeal to you and exhort you to contend for the faith which was once and for all handed down to the saints. The faith which is that sum of Christian belief which was delivered verbally to the holy people of God. Glory to God. Earnestly contend for the faith. And we're going to talk about this kind of faith. I like the scripture because it tells us that there is a contending for the kind of um, faith that these saints had. The faith that we heard about, you know, George Whitfield and those that, that started a long time ago, the faith that people had that we read about, you know, in the Bible that we're, the Bible says that we'll do, be strong and do exploits, but this whole thing is written, the whole book, the whole word of God is written about those people that were strong and had courage and did exploits for God. They walked with God. They understood how to walk with God. But the faith they experienced that we read about it had to be contended for. It was a faith that we, and we will have to do this. This is not bad news, this is good news. I'll tell you right now, this devil, 
that'll come. And he'll say, now, you know, why aren't you just going to give that little project? You're not, it migged all about, you know, you got too much to do up here on this mountain. You just need to stay here with the prayers. You just need to give that over. I saw your news conference last night. You did? Yes, I did. I saw it and I heard what you said. But I'm telling you, he's going to come back and he's going to say, you know, don't you just think, I mean, you know, you got enough to do. And, and if you just let him do it, at the end of the day, you'll just be like, you'll, you'll feel like you've been shot through holes through you all day long. This is not contending for your faith. There's another word that we could use instead of contending, we could say fight for. You have to fight for that kind of faith. You got to live in that kind of faith. You got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do what it says. Now I have a friend here and he's always amazed me. He his, his, uh, you all know him, but um, his ministry has al always followed his ministry, miracles and signs and wonders, the supernatural power of God. And he goes, you know, all over the world preaching. And uh, my point in bringing this information to you is that we have people among us that are strong in faith and fight and contend. But, but I want you to hear a story just, uh, just to, to just bring you up a, a few little notches here, you know, climbing a ladder or whatever to heaven this morning. And uh, David, come here. This is David and Cherie, you can stand up, come up, whatever. She, she, this is David Horton, David and Cherie Horton. Come here, David. heard this story about David and um, actually it's about David's mother and uh, I think she's going to be up this afternoon so I'm setting her up here but um, her, her name is Jerry Horton and Jerry and Doc Horton have been just in the ministry for forever and ever and ever <laughs> that I can remember and Doc Horton went home to be with the Lord on September the 15th but there and praise God he's home but it was time I mean you know he was 88 and he was ready he was ready to go, amen. And so it's God that he is there. And whatever ways he can help, he is doing it, I can tell you. He always did his job. So, um, but David, <laughs> David, I have a story about, and I, I want you to, I want, what I want you to hear is just a note of maybe the difference in where you can walk and then, you know, ad, how you can advance to a higher plane of life and live it, live it. Okay, David. Amen, praise the Lord. Uh, Lucy, when Lucy calls you in, in, in the morning uh, and says, are you gonna be at the morning meeting? And you said, yep. Uh, then you come, you know, praise the Lord. <laughs> Whether you were planning to or not. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost wanted this for you. <laughs> and Lucy, amen, praise the Lord. Well, praise God. You know, you know God, I loved the word that she's bringing us today. Amen, God never changes. We need to, it's just simple, simple truths like that are the most powerful. Yes, they are. And, uh, and our, er, how many know that there's been changes in the last uh, two years in our nation that maybe we never imagined that we would be seeing and more changes coming. But thank God we can always go back to the fact that God never changes. Uh, my family, uh, uh, I'm a fifth generation Pentecostal person. My great, great grandmother wore her hair in a knot and spoke in tongues. And, uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, uh, we, my mother was healed of terminal cancer in 1954, and she had uh, melanoma, malignancy that had, that had metastasized and spread throughout her body. Uh, they had removed 49 tumors, 
small ones because they're melanomas, but they're very deadly, those, those things in, in the natural. And they had removed 49 tumors off of my mother's body. And the doctor said, we have to stop doing surgery now because there's a limit to what they can do. And said, uh, basically, it's a lost cause surgically because they're popping out on the inside of your body just as much as on the outside. So it's taking you over. They would do uh, blood samples and uh, uh, find uh, the, the cancer cells in the bloodstream. So in other words, it, it was everywhere. It was just a matter of time for it to, to, to do its job in, in killing her. And, she, said, and uh, she was 22 years of age. My father was pastoring. And uh, long story short, because that's not the story we're telling, but it's important to the story. Uh, my mother was healed of terminal cancer. She, she had a vision of, of Jesus or an angel. She's not quite sure which, but something spiritual, uh, dressed in white, came in the room of the eighth floor, came in the door, told her she was healed, and then went out through the wall. So pretty much when it goes out through the wall, you know it's spiritual. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, she held fast to that, uh, even though her symptoms immediately at that point did not leave, she held fast to the word that she had received, amen, and that word could come supernaturally or it could come just from Scripture. The Scripture is supernatural as well. And so she stood on that, received her healing, and in a matter of, uh, of, of days she began to, to amend, and uh, she's still with us now, amen. And uh, this next year she'll be 80 years old. And uh, she, she's in the medical journals as the longest living person with that uh, advancement of melanoma on the, in the Harvard Medical Review or whatever it is they print that. Hallelujah. And uh, has, been, has never had a re-diagnosis since. And that was 1954, so that's a long time. Uh, the doctors told my mother, they said, you know, uh, you'll never be able to conceive children or have any more children because the uh, principle uh, of this uh, malignancy was in her reproductive organs, and they said there's no way you can carry a baby. Uh, don't, don't, don't expect it. Don't plan on it. And she said, well, you told me I was going to die, and I didn't, so I would just believe God and have a baby. So in the terms of faith, uh, connecting to, 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 uh, to, to what uh, Lucy has on her heart to accomplish today, in terms of faith, my mother never cared what the doctor said, never cared what they said, well, this is the final word, you know, you need to be smart and listen to this. And she was like, well, that's not what the word says, that's not what God said, and I go by what he says. So thank you for your information, but, you know, we've got higher information. And so they told her uh, that, um, that basically her, 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 uh, her womb had never uh, fully developed. There was no way f f on earth physically that she could have a baby or carry a baby, even though my sister was born before that. Anyway, uh, I, uh, so she, she didn't know that till after the fact. They said, well, how do you explain our, my daughter? And they said, well, we're not quite sure where you carried. I always told my sister, that proves you're an alien, you were hatched from an egg. My older sister, you know, is a <laughs> anyway, like a real normal family uh, with all this, uh, the strife that goes with that. But um, it's all in good jest. Anyway, uh, three years later, I was born and my, my mother, uh, the doctor said, well, we don't, we don't know how you carried this child. Really, it's impossible, which might prove that I'm an alien. I'm not, I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> hallelujah. And um, anyway, uh, it was really a miracle. So my mom and, and dad, because of, of these miracles they had had in their own life, they never panicked. Uh, you know, relatives would call on the phone. I, I grew up in a home that did not understand panic. I never understood panic and frantic till I got around, you know, more acquainted with other normal Christians <laughs> who would freak out over things. But we never had a freak out or a meltdown. 
or a panic or a frantic because no matter what the news was on the other end of the phone, no matter what relative called with what report from the doctor, my mom would say, well, we know God. And so we would go to prayer and then get things turned around. So we never panicked at any news. There was no news that caused a, a panic or a frantic. And I didn't understand those words until later in life, when, like I said, when you get around other people that know how to do that well. It's a part of their whole, in fact, it's some of them, it's a part of their prayer life. It's like emergency tongues, you know, go into, <laughs> kick into gear. There's no faith in it. It's just meltdown, you know, with tongues on top. <laughs> and, they, and they wonder why it never works, you know. It's like, well, you're not in faith. That's why. <laughs> Whatever we do, we should do expecting to change, amen, not just busy work, you know. I've thought about that sometimes. You ever been in a meeting where something, something happened, you know, somebody, you know, falls out and they bring in the EMT and somebody says, pray in tongues, everybody. I said, well, what are we doing? Because we're calling the emergency people. It's like a coloring sheet in school. You know, it's busy where I got to go out in the hall, color. All right. Anyway. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking? Yeah. Pray in tongues. We don't know what else to do. <laughs> well, we prayed in tongues, but it was never emergency. In fact, my dad, when he would uh, get to going in tongues, it would take him a while to get cranked up. He sounded like a, a, a chainsaw starting up, you know. You know, my, my, mom's, my mom had a quick start, you know, she's up here somewhere, my dad's trying to get down and find a place to, and uh, <clears throat> clearing his throat and to get his tongue going. You observe these things as a child growing up with Pentecostal people. <laughs> it's a different sort of center of gravity. So my... Uh, like I said, we never were taught how to panic or melt down. So one day, my, my dad was a state overseer for the Pentecostal denomination that he was with. And, uh, and uh, in the state of New Mexico, which was in those days, and I understand it still is, a mission state for that denomination, meaning that uh, they, they don't have very many churches and so forth. They had about 20 churches spread out across that state. And if, you ever, if, you, if you're from New Mexico or ever been there much, it's a large state geographically and miles and miles and hours and hours between cities. I think it's probably shortened up some with uh, interstates, but this is the 60s. So you're on little U.S. roads and county roads and dirt roads and going through ghost towns and on the edge of mountains and trying to get from point A to point B, and, and it would always take a long time. And uh, the doctor had examined my dad. Uh, I was eight years old at the time and said, you know, man, said, you're, you're burning the candle at both ends. You need to slow down or you're going to, you know, he could have a heart attack or something here. you got too much stress. And, of course, you know, those guys in those days, their mantra was, uh, I'd rather burn out than rust out. So they just didn't believe in resting or taking vacations or anything. In fact, when we, if we ever did talk my dad into a vacation, like go to Disneyland or something, he always wore a suit. And I said, Dad, you look like an idiot, you know, wearing a suit around the Church of God Pentecostal preacher at Disneyland. And I said, why are you wearing a suit on a vacation day? And he said, you never know who I'm going to run into that needs prayer. i got to represent the gospel, you know. It was... Uh, it was a, it's a different day, you know, a different way, different group, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but he was always the preacher from day one to oh. the end. And uh, so anyway, my, uh, my dad, you know, didn't heed the doctor's advice or whatever. And so sure enough, one day I'm walking through the living room of our parsonage. Always had beige, beige carpet and parsonages because it goes with every color of the furniture of the next guy moving in. That's the committee voted that in like that. 
tell you, so when the next guy comes in, right? Yeah, I'm eight years old, and we're on the beige carpet in the living room. And I'm walking through, and uh, my dad is flat on the floor. Now, he's not the kind of guy that would take a nap on the floor in the living room, you know, because he's got that suit on and everything. And... Uh, <laughs> I mean, eternally. He's still got on one right now. We buried him in one. <laughs> Absolutely. Wouldn't have thought of anything else. And um, anyway, he's laying, <laughs> he's laying out there across the, across the, the floor, and he's, and he's just whiter than normal. And, uh, and his mouth is open, and he's not breathing, and there's no pulse, and, uh, you know, and, uh, he, and his eyes are, you know, kind of back, and, and I'm thinking, everything I've seen on Westerns and TV, I'm pretty sure he's dead. Now, and, you know, at eight years old, you assess these things. Now, like I said, we're a family that never panics, so my mom's in the kitchen washing dishes. She's wearing a dress in the middle of the day because our denomination didn't let you women wear anything but a dress because so, God hates legs. <laughs> hates them. <laughs> uh, hates any legs showing on women, you know, the separation of the, the pants. So my mom's got on a dress and an apron, you know, and she, my mom was always, you know, wearing that dress, and, you know, she's like the person in the, in the ads, you know, she would be ironing, you know, I mean, uh, or ironing or, or vacuuming, you know, with that dress on and high heel shoes, you know, and <laughs> housewife from the 60s, you know, Tower of Babel hair. <clears throat> Reaching, reaching heaven with the hair, the Tower of Babel. And uh, so her apron, and she's in there washing the dishes, and I'm in the living room with the dead dad. And I said, this is where we were at with our faith, just, you know, it doesn't matter what, we believe God, what else are you going to do? And uh, I said, I, once I assess that I'm pretty sure he's dead, I felt down, no pulse, nothing. He's cold as ice. He was dead. It was confirmed later. But I said to, I, I, I lifted up my voice and I said, Mama, Daddy dropped dead in the living room. I mean, I didn't scream, I didn't cry, I didn't holler because I hadn't been taught to do that. I said, Mama, Daddy dropped dead in the living room. She said, God is my witness. She said from the kitchen, all right, I'll be in there in a minute. She did? All right, I'll be in there in a minute. So a few seconds go by, here she comes, you know, drying her hands on that apron. And she's kind of, she says, well, what's, what do you think's happening? And I said, well, he looked, I think he's dead. She said, um, yeah, he looks he looks dead to me too. She said, did you, did you check his pulse? I said, yeah. She said, well, let me get down here. So she gets down there and puts her ear. She said, I don't hear anything breathing. She says, I think he's dead too. She says, well, we'll just call him back because if he thinks he's going to leave us stuck out here with these 20 churches in the middle of the desert. <laughs> He's crazy. 
I said, well, what are you going to do? She said, well, just call him back. He'll come back. She said, Doc Horton, wherever you are, in the name of Jesus, you get back in this body. Then she looked at me and said, he'll be back in a minute. We were like crazy people. I mean, you know, just, <laughs> so he, he, uh, he, he chokes and, you know, coughs a little bit and comes back. Color comes back in his face and his eyes adjust. And she said, honey, where were you? He says, I think I died. I, I left. She said, if you ever die like that and leave me again, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, the end of the story is they went, they, she said, now go on and get, you know, changed. We're going to the doctor and see what happened. We went to the doctor to see what happened after the miracle, to confirm the miracle. Never to go to get the miracle from the doctor. You went to have him confirm that, you know, so that, so that when you tell the testimony at church that you've got, you know, qualification. All right, so he went to the doctor. They did the test, and they said, which paramedics did you call because the adrenaline and everything that's in your system had to be added, you know, um, superficially, extra. And somebody puts all the stuff in your, in your veins that we use to revive people from a, from a heart attack event. And my mom said, nobody, we just prayed. We just believed God. And that guy says, oh, you're one of those kind. And she said, well, yeah, we'd otherwise would have a dead husband. Amen. I bet you don't need that. No. <clears throat> there are people among us even today. Yeah, and, 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 you know, she's got a pretty good setup for this afternoon. She'll be in the generational prayer meeting at, uh, what is it, 2.30? At 2.30 this afternoon, giving her testimony about prayer. But um, isn't it prayer in her life? And goodness knows what she'll say. Because she, she is so strong in God and their whole family is. And this is... My point about being raised up and understanding about the contending for your faith. Hallelujah. And, and you have to fight for that kind of faith. And you have to live that kind of faith every single day. And that, that testimony about them and so many things about their family have been such, such a testimony for my own personal life that I just... I don't know why, but I just began to think about it in the, in the last few days. And I thought, where is he in the, all the earth? <laughs> and, and when somebody said that you were here, I was like, I don't know why, but I, I got to work this in. And so th this is, where, th this is where, where we're all going. The kind of faith, the kind of faith and fight that contends for Miracles, the supernatural, signs and wonders, the glory of God, the great awakening of all nations to the Spirit of God. These are the kind of people we are. And we got to fight for it. That, that, that's the thing. We have to fight for it. Now, in 2 Timothy, the first chapter, we won't go there for a time's sake, but in the first chapter, in the 12th verse, it said, Paul said there, and he was talking to his spiritual son, Timothy, and he said, I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is he. He is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul didn't say, I know in what I have believed. He said, I know who I have believed in. I know who I have believed in. And it's, you know, it's, it's one thing to know what you believe. It's a good thing to know what you believe. It's important to know in your life what you actually believe. 
There's some Christians that, you know, when you ask them what they believe or know about the Bible, it's, it's, it's real nebulous and unclear. They, they, just don't, they just don't know a lot. They don't understand a lot. And it is important to know what we believe about God and different things about God. And, and the Bible is, is full of things that we should know about what we believe. There are things in the word that even though things have changed in the last even 24 hours or months or whatever, time, time has changed. Those things, there's things that have never changed and will not ever change. But what you believe will come under fire. This is not a prophet of gloom, prophecy of gloom and doom. I'm just telling you. What you believe is going to come under fire in one way or another as you live your life. There'll be a reason or reasons not to believe what you used to believe. There'll be a reason not to believe that anymore. Why would you quit believing what you used to put, you know, real high value in? Why would you stop believing that? Why would you change? But because things around you look more believable than what you once believed. That's why we change. And so then what happens is we exchange whatever we used to believe for something easier to believe. It's just easier to believe it because this is what's happened to me. And at first, you know, we're all taught what to believe. And there's definitely no contending in that. You don't have to contend then. That's not where you contend. But if you are going to stay believing, I'm talking about these people in this meeting today and those that are watching live streaming or whatever. If we are going to stay believing what we believe, through all the different seasons of life, you are going to have to contend for what you believe. This, these are the facts. Now, what helps you and what is gonna be the reason that you are able to hold on to what you believe is knowing who you believe. Because what we are um, believe you know, inside Christianity about uh, different sets of philosophies and, and uh, um, what we believe about doctrines and none of our Christianity is based on that like other religions. Christianity is based on what God himself has said. That's it. And so we believe what we believe because God said it. He said it. And once you know what God said, once you know who said it, it becomes more and more difficult to change what you believe when you know the one that said it. Hallelujah. Now let's go over here to Luke, the 22nd chapter. <clears throat> And here in verse 31, Jesus is here talking to Peter. And he said, Peter, listen, Satan has asked excessively that all of you be given up to him out of the power and keeping of God that he might sift all of you like wheat or sift all of you like grain. But then Jesus said this, but I have prayed especially for you, Peter, that your own faith may not fail. And when you yourself have turned again, strengthen and establish 
your brethren. Hallelujah. He said, I have prayed that your faith may not fail. Well, do we know that was Jesus' prayer answered about Peter? Because we do see here that Peter did deny Jesus three times. So it kind of seems like, sort of, that Jesus' faith and prayer that he prayed for Peter, that Peter did fail, and actually Jesus' prayer failed. And actually, though, I have found that that's not exactly, actually, I found that that wasn't even what Jesus was praying about. Now, where you're concerned, life happens, situations happen, challenges happen, and we fail. Sometimes other people fail. Sometimes people, uh, we fail, other people fail around us, situations fail, the government fails, the economy fails, 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 fails. This and this and this happens. So, over here we have this, Jesus praying for Peter, and then... We have life happening to us right here. And in this scripture right here, actually, Peter did fail. His commitment to the Lord failed when it got right down to it. And he got scared and he got tormented and he was scared he was going to die and Jesus just died, and where is he? And he can't help me, and he did fail. His commitment to the Lord failed. But what Jesus actually was praying for was that his faith fail not. So did his faith fail? Actually, what Jesus was praying was that Peter's faith in Jesus would not fail. His faith, not just in his commitment to Jesus, but his faith in Jesus. His faith in what about Jesus? Well, Peter could have said this, I failed. Wow, look what I did. I denied Jesus three times. I really failed. I'm never going to be able to come back to Jesus again. Does Jesus still love Peter? Yeah, he does. Can, but can Peter actually really trust that because he's done what he's done, can, does Jesus still love him? Why do we love Jesus today? Because the Bible says that he first loved us. That's why we love him. Glory to God. No matter who you are and no matter what you become, Jesus still, he loves you. He loves you. You didn't come up with this first. Jesus came up with this first. He first loved you. Somebody told you that Jesus loved you and you responded to that love and then he responded to you by keeping on, keeping on, keeping loving you. He keeps responding to you and you keep responding to Jesus and then his love gets bigger and his love gets bigger. And only to the degree that you continue to know his love and his provision for your life and you keep receiving his love, does that love grow in you? Only to that degree. Jesus prayed that Peter's faith would not fail. After he'd fallen, you know, that's one thing. But then to have a deficit in your faith Because, well, let's see. I did this over here, and so I don't know if Jesus is going to be able to trust me anymore. So then I don't know if I can trust Jesus to to be able to forgive me or not. This is what happens with life sometimes. When we fail or, or things fail, you know, around us. This is where the contending of faith of your own faith comes in. Because what the enemy wanted to do here with Peter, when Peter failed, I have the spirit of prayer on me for 
God's people to get it. We've got to get this. So important. The devil wanted to do what he wanted. This is his gold. Goal. This is his immeasurable greatness. If he was here today, he can't come in here. He can't come in here because I'm here. He ain't coming near here. He wanted to make sure I'm going to seal this off. I got it made here. I'm going to make sure that this Peter, he's never going to turn back to me again. He's never coming back to me. I'm the, I'm, I'm the master. He's never coming to Jesus. He's never going to turn back to Jesus. The devil, he didn't want Peter to ever have faith in Jesus again. Ever. Okay. Okay, I've done it now. This is Peter, and he's denied Jesus three times. He's over in some dark place. It's over. Jesus and I, we can't have a relationship because I can't believe that he's ever going to strive with me anymore. He's not. I know he's not. The devil wanted Peter to keep his eyes on his failure and have him never look back to Jesus again for anything. He'd just keep his eyes on the situation. He'd just keep his eyes on the report. He'd just keep his eyes on what he had done. He'd just keep his eyes on the upcoming events that led up to his failures. The upcoming events of what are we going to do now Jesus is dead? What are we doing? If you look to Jesus, no matter where you are today, Jesus is the author. Yes, he's the author. And he's the finisher also. He's the finisher of your faith. And sometimes in between, him authorizing and authoring your faith. Sometime between that point and him finishing your faith, there's a bit of life that happens. <laughs> so in that, you know, there's a lot of times it's, it's, there's, a reason, it's, there's a reason for us to begin to doubt God. I'm talking really good reason. I'm talking good reason, hard evidence, hard evidence for us to say, this, wait, wait, this, 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 this really is happening. This is really happening. This is David, eight years old. Oh, this, this is really happening. Hey, he's dead. Oh my God, he's dead. Oh, Jesus, he's failed us. Life happens. We can't be people that doubt God. No. <laughs> Good reasons. Good reasons to doubt God. Hard evidence for us to say. This really is happening. And this wasn't exactly the way I read in the Bible about Jesus. I don't know, you know, I might be wrong about what I thought about Jesus. Or maybe, you know, what, what I thought they were teaching me, it was wrong. Maybe, maybe it's, it's wrong, it's not true because I can't do what it says right now. I can't because Jesus said, Jesus said for me to do this and I would be better. I would be all well and I'm not better. I didn't get better. But instead, I'm worse. Maybe what Jesus said is not true because God did not do this for me. But Jesus prayed that your faith wouldn't fail. Faith in what? Faith in what you believe? No. Faith in him. Because it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. 
we have to look back to Jesus. You have to look back. You gotta look back to Jesus. Well, this is what you said. This is what we believed, but this is how it is now. So what am I looking to? I'm looking, so I'm, I'm looking back to Jesus for provision. The, the provision for this, this right here. No matter what your circumstance is, we have to look back because he is the author and he himself is the finisher of your faith. And so Jesus prays for Peter, but Jesus is at the right hand of God in his full body now praying for every single one of us in this whole building. That when life happens, when your things in your life happen, that you will look back to him. Just look back to him again. Well, I, I believe, Lord, for this to turn around and instead it went this way. Instead, this is the way it is now. I'm not in denial, Lord, this is the way it is. So now I look back to you again, Jesus. I look, I look up this way. And no matter what, no matter how it looks now, I no, that you will finish that that you authorized and started in my life. I have faith in you, Jesus. I still have faith in your ability. I still have faith in your love. I still have faith in your word. I still have faith in your life in me. It's true. Jesus, your life in me, I know it's working. No matter the report. And you're still not going to fail. You're still not going to fail me, Jesus. And then that is how your faith will come and begin to move over to its full end. Now, back to the instrument deal and the pitch thing that we remember we talked about in the beginning. Uh, our song was absolutely beautiful in practice. And before we started, we all had to see that, and, and, and this is the way it is in any orchestra or music group, you have to see that all the instruments are, are tuned. And so before anything's ever played or anything's ever sung or anything, all strings, all instruments, and everything have to be tuned to the right pitch all together. And the instruments have to be in tune with not only themselves, but each instrument has to be in tune with one another. That's the way it all gets started in music. Hallelujah. And even though, you know, our song was... <laughs> Oh my goodness, it was rehearsed over and over, perfectly, played perfectly. If it's not on the right pitch, in tune, it turns out pathetic. I can give you that glorious testimony. Hallelujah. When you play music with other people and people are, other people are singing and playing, everyone has to be on the same note the same pitch. You can't just, you know, now we can't come up with our own ideas. And what life does to different people as things happen, change happens. <laughs> and, 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 we can, and we can come up with, you know, our own solutions to these things. We can come up with our own sound or our own pitch. Well, I've been around the block a few years and in ministry and whatever, and this is what I have come to think. This is what I now know that I've been around the block and been in ministry. This is the way I see it now. But what if it's not the truth, what you see? What if what you think is not truth, is not truth? the perfect note. There is a truth because Jesus said what? I am the truth. 
And so it is with all instruments. We don't just decide, you know, which pitch we're going to tune with. It's not okay to do that. When you're playing music, it is definitely not okay. You just don't on your own decide a note and just play that. And then it just sounds great. just happens. There has to be the proper and the right pitch for everybody to tune with. And with tuning, you have to be humble. When you play something and, you know, it's just a little bit different or your thing over here is your instrument is just a little bit different. You can't say, I don't care what you say. I think this is the right way. So this is the way we're going to do it. And, th- and, and when I say it, this is the way it's going to sound. Uh, when my sister and I, we were, this was in... <laughs> 1951, the spring of 51. And my sister and I, we were four years old. And so we went to Miss Helen's dance school, Miss Helen. And uh, so we had for her recital, now Miss Helen's mother played the piano. And so this was all the music that we had at the dance recital. This is not like dance recitals today where you have orchestras and, you know, everything. So we were four. And so there was kind of a barnyard theme to the the, uh, recital. And so Lynn and I, uh, we were told that we were going to be chickens. Two chickens. We were four. So get the picture. Uh, the Montgomery, uh, the Montgomery um, City Auditorium, 1950. We're backstage. We're dressed like chickens. We have curls everywhere and bows and even chicken hats. Now I can't tell you what a chicken hat looks like today, but or whatever, just use your imagination. And we are four, and we come on to the stage. And I don't think we had ever been on a stage before. I can't remember anything about that, really. I just remember, and I'm told about it, I, there is a, a, some kind of a reel-to-reel film or something of it that's supposedly hysterical. But... <clears throat> So here we are, and we come on, and, you know, the lights hit us, and uh, we got greatly inspired (laughs) with, I guess, uh, you know, I don't know what could happen to two four-year-olds, but, you know, we, uh, with illusions of grandeur as to, you know, the barnyard and the whole thing that was happening. And so just picture, you know, two little bitty girls here, and we're in, in the recital, And Miss Helen's mother begins to play the piano. And so we know the song. We've learned the song. We can sing the song. But we began to sing just because of, you know, we we were getting great vibrations from the audience. (laughs) You know, somehow when you begin to do some things, you know, the cuteness factor, it starts building in the auditorium. Uh, but the cuteness factor doesn't help your faith. And, 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 and you, you got to be on pitch and you got to do the right thing. You can't just be, or you could be labeled as a four-year-old child. But that was what was cute about it. But my sister and I, it was something about, and the sun came out, and the sun, <laughs> and, and there we were. And then the more the audience, you know, came and just inspired us and encouraged us and everything. We, we began, Miss Helen's mother was not even, she, she wasn't in the picture. The song was out of the picture. Everything, Lynn and I, we took over. <laughs> you know, it would be like somebody, you know, get a hook and get them off. <laughs> But as 
actually now where we are in this faith, the things that I'm talking about in tuning instruments and being tuned to the right pitch in God, you don't get to do it your own way. This could be, you could be labeled as a child, childish, hallelujah. Tuning, tuning yourself to God and contending for faith doesn't have anything to do with your opinion or what you think, you know, the barnyard dance should have been or, or Miss Helen or Miss Helen's mother or the chicken costume or how enamored we were with each other and just, you know, like I said, the cuteness factor. This has to do with God and God alone and what he has said. Hallelujah. And this is either going to be when we get home and we go out to our, you know, various and sundry places. What you're thinking and what you're believing is either going to be right or wrong. Hallelujah. It's either going to be the truth working in your life or not truth. Now, there can be room for opinion in many different areas in our lives. But when God says something, there is no room for opinion. It is true. It is true. Definitely it is true. So when life begins to happen, we tune up this way. What, what are some things that could get an instrument out of tune? Bad weather, bumping it, the, the temperature rising and falling. Just playing an instrument can get it. Working an instrument can get it. As I said, you can bump it against something. If, a, if an instrument has more than one string, that means one string can be more in tune than another string. And you still have the same thing. You still have to get everything tuned up. And it's the same way with what we believe. Some things can start getting out of tune because of, you know, influence around you or the way other people think or what other people have said to you or maybe the doctor's report or just life happens. Life happens. And when life happens, we don't just stay out of tune and just, you know, keep on tapping to our own You know, we don't just keep on going in that direction. We bring ourselves to the word of God. And we say, hey, I, I, I got to know what you got, what, what you have to say about this, Jesus. Because I know in whom I have believed. How, how do I get myself, you know, Jesus... What do I do now? How, how do, because what you don't understand about war and prayer and these different things, there is warfare all around you all the time concerning, you know, different, different things. And so we could say opportunities in life bring warfare against you. And that is an opportunity for you to believe something other than what Jesus said. It's just called warfare. And you need to identify it as this is warfare. <laughs> How am I gonna realign myself with you? When you bump your car, you know, into another car, or you, or you know, back up and drive over the curb or whatever, it can knock your whole car out of alignment. And then it, what it does, it messes up your steering device. And you can still drive a car. You're still driving along. But when you drive, your car is always going to be eh, pushing, pulling to the right, pulling this way, pulling. You're always trying to get your car, you know, realigned back into the road. No, you take your car and you have it realigned. And when life's bumps happen, 
We don't just tune in, you know, to our feelings. We don't tune to our past. We don't tune to what other people have to say. We don't tune to your friends or tune to, you know, the other singers in the a cappella group. <laughs> in fact, there can be a group of people, you can sit down at a restaurant and you can all be out of tune and you can be in total agreement <laughs> and perfect harmony and agreement, totally wrong. We don't tune to one another. We don't tune to, you know, the CBS news or the, any news for that matter. God Almighty has something to say about every area of our life. Every area of your life. Think about it. Every area of your life. And you know what? That opinion and that what he thinks about your life is not going to change. It's never going to change what he thinks about you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No matter what happens with the government, no matter what happens with the economy, whatever happens, you know, whatever, no matter what's happened with you, with your, with say like some sickness or uh, in your body or sickness some in your family, somebody you know, your finances, your relationships, we in this place will still have to contend and you are going to have to fight for what you believe every day. And so there's this prayer that Jesus is praying here over people that follow him. And he said that when life's winds blow, Our looking to Jesus is never going to fail. That's the prayer. We'll just look back to him. And it's not going to be a thing like, well, if this doesn't work, I'll try this. No. But we'll keep looking at him. We'll keep with, a, with singleness of gaze looking at him so that he can finish what he started in our lives. He said, earnestly contend for the faith, for the quality of faith that brings miracles, for the quality. This is a, a quality of faith that brings signs and wonders. This is, this is what we, we are aspiring to and where we're going. And there is a contending for it. It's always been contended for and it will continue to be that way. In every group of people, in every generation, in every season of God, and we're in a season of God right now, there have been people that contended for their faith. I, 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 I'm just amazed at, you know, what Billy was saying about all, all of the people that went before us. And... Then I thought back, you know, I was thinking back even this morning about Abraham and how he had his own relationship with God, his own relationship, just particular with him, particular to Abraham. And he found God, you know, by a tree, it says in the Bible. And he talked to him by that oak tree and from that conversation came more conversations. From the more conversations came a covenant. From the more covenant, the covenant came more families in. Hallelujah, and that's the way it worked. But God wasn't just the God of Abraham. Remember what Billy said about Isaac? God was the God of Isaac. And he didn't find God by the oak tree. He found God by a well, the God who sees me. That's where he found God. And God just wasn't the, the God of Isaac and Abraham. He was the God of Jacob. And Jacob contended for his faith in another way. And he moved in other ways in God. Hallelujah. 
And he feasted on that. Hallelujah. But if we as Christians, we choose not to disbelieve God and we choose to believe him, believe what we have heard, believe what we have prayed, just like um, um, Reese Howells, he continued to believe. I mean, people were dying everywhere. It looked really bad. And he in the college declared the victory of God over Hitler every single day. Hallelujah. That's where we are. That's where we are right here today. Do we ever have reason to disbelieve God? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we have reason to disbelieve God. But that's where the fight of faith is coming in for you. And that's where the warfare is. And I loved what Phil Driscoll said. He said, you just take a key and you just turn the key and separate the disbelief from from all the other things that God said. Don't let it in. Turn the key and lock the door. Don't let it come in. We look away from those things that would challenge our faith and we look back into Jesus and he will finish what he started. There, there's people in here today and you know, you, know, you know all the names of God and you have known God as Jehovah Jireh, God your provider and you know God and you know his word But this last year, you know, it's given you some reasons to wonder if God is indeed your provider. And you know what? The Bible says right here, Jesus is praying for you that your faith fail not. And you don't put your faith and your confidence and your eyes in the changing world system and everything that's going out here. But you fix your eyes on Jesus. He's your provider. He is your God. Because what? That's what he said. He authored that faith in you and he will finish that faith in you. He's your provider now. Not just in the good times. He's your provider right now today. And then I know there's others here in addition to those that just maybe wonder a little bit about provision. There's others here that just you, you, you got out of alignment with some things, some things that happened around you, maybe some things that happened in your family or some, some, something about, you know, some things in the church or on your job or something. And you're going to have to let these things just keep, stop jolting your soul. Stop rattling your life. Because Jesus said, that he was praying for you. The devil, he wants to sift you like wheat. Get a picture of that. Just put you in a little sifter. Just keep on doing it. Just keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on, just keep on sifting. Till there's nothing left. You just keep draining out. You just keep pulling out. It just keeps draining out of you. That's what the devil, that's what he wants to do. And then after you failed, he'll say, see, told you. Told you it wasn't true. No, but Jesus is praying for you right now. That your faith won't fail. Because I'm telling you, he's a good Jesus. 
and you know him whom you have believed in. The Bible says he's a friend. He sticks closer than a brother. He won't fail you. He has never failed you. I don't care how it looks. It's not over. It's not over. And there are people here that, you know, you've had some challenges in your physical body this year. And this is going to be something that for only people, uh, I, I wasn't sure about this, but I'm, I'm now just from hearing David talk. This is, there have been people that you've been given a report and it's about a, as bad of a report as you could get. Is this really happening? Yeah, yeah, it really is happening. Is this really a, really a report? Yeah, it really is a report. <laughs> and Jesus wants you to look unto him. Look back unto him. Because the finished work that Jesus did for your healing, it cannot be changed. Other people's body changes, your body changes, different reports have come, but the work that Jesus did is unchangeable. And so we lift that work of healing like a banner over this place because the compassion of God is here for you. Now this is just not gonna be about any healing. This is gonna be for anybody that you have been given a death sentence. I'm talking about like somebody like Jerry Horton. And also we're going to do something else. It says in Acts chapter 19, concerning this move of God, you know, this is what I have. In Acts chapter 19, Paul said, it says, it, it says about Paul there, it says that special miracles were done by the hands of Paul because handkerchiefs and aprons were taken uh, for, for him and, and that from him and they were laid upon the bodies of people and sick people. And when those cloths and, 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 and napkins were laid on the people, it says sickness went away from them. It was driven out. And it also says that demons came out. They were, they were driven out. This is what the anointing of the Holy Spirit does. This is what the anointing of the Holy Spirit does to heal people. When Jesus was here on the earth, the Bible says the same anointing that anointed Jesus, it says, and this is what it says about his anointing, Jesus, and you all know these scriptures, so easy. This is so easy. He went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. For what? God was with him. And God is with you. And Jesus is at the right hand of the Father praying for you that your faith may not fail. Whether you feel like you've been sifted, you know, all the way out maybe on the floor. Whatever happened, life happens. It happens and it will happen. That same anointing that anointed Jesus, it's here today. God Almighty was in that anointing. And it says in the Bible that that anointing is like a mantle or a cloak being covered, like covering over you and being poured down over you. That's what the anointing of the Holy Spirit was that was upon Jesus. And, it was, and the effect of it was that that anointing was also went and it was on Paul and it got into some cloths 
And those claws were laid on people that had sickness and the sickness went out and demons even went out also. I know years ago, not too many years ago, I was ministering in Nova Scotia with my friend Vicki Jameson Peterson. And uh, so um, we had it in our hearts and this came back to me that <clears throat> we always pr prayed for cloths it, it, during the, at the end of the meeting, it prayed about prayer cloths and we would hold them and pray about them that the healing anointing of God would be in them just like Paul Acts chapter 19. And so I remember this meeting in Nova Scotia and there was this lady and she came up and her daughter couldn't come to the meeting. And so she asked for a cloth for her daughter was sick with some devil thing. And her daughter also wanted, uh, her daughter also wanted to, she had need of great provision. She needed something about, you know, her house was being repossessed and she needed something about, um, some other kinds of provision and she, she wanted to have a child. I mean, it was like, wow, here's your cloth. But you know, <laughs> but, but somehow the anointing of God it went into that cloth and in that cloth was everything that that lady needed to rearrange her life. And Vicki called me on the phone and she said, this is, this is absolutely amazing about God. What he did in the same meeting, some lady got a, a cloth and she went down the street to her neighbor who wasn't even saved and her neighbor believed what she said. Hey, 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 uh, whatever, Elizabeth, I have a cloth for you. If you would just put it on your husband, you know, he won't die. Now, if you don't know anything, just think how insane that sounds. Here's, a, here's a, a piece of a sheet that we got from this meeting we were in. But you know what? That lady, she believed that, took it down the street to the neighbor and the husband, he was totally healed. Neither one of them believers. Isn't that something? And so this is what I had in my heart today concerning the awakening. First of all, if you are sick in your body and the report is unto death, I'm not making light of it. I understand that there is a great torment and other things that are related to this. If, then I want you to come down to the front and just line up here. And you have been given a report that you are not going to make it. Step out of your seat and come down to the front. Don't be shy. Jesus, Jesus is praying for you today. You can come right in the front. Is this somebody? Is she coming? Anybody coming? But now, Sharon, I want you to sing, O oh, love of God, how rich, how pure. Praise the Lord. We'll give you time. The love of God is greater for his love is greater far than pen or tongue. Than man or tongue could ever tell. Could ever tell. It goes beyond. Goes beyond the highest star. The highest star. And reaches to. The lowest hell. Oh, the love of God. Oh, Jesus. Come on. How rich and pure. How measure 
How measureless is his love. Oh, how strong. It shouts forevermore endure. It shall forevermore endure. The saints and angels. The saints and angels sing. Saints and angels so Now, Pauline, where are those um, aprons and things? Um, I believe because of the great awakening in our country that healing is gonna be taken out of here into all the parts of this country and around the world. <clears throat> Healing is not just in this room, but it's going out from here. And I believe because of the great awakening, it's one of the things that God wants to do with believers. And so we're gonna pray over these aprons and if you need one you can come to the side aisle an usher or harriet or you can you can go over there i'm going to pray for them at the end i'm gonna lay hands on these people first oh stop yeah right there and then harriet will you take another and go over here with them now these aprons and napkins are going to be for someone that you know that is sick or has been diagnosed with a sickness and they might die. Or maybe you're just scared they might die. But the Bible says that Jesus He's at the right hand of God and he's praying that our faith in him, it will not fail. And when we have turned again, we'll strengthen our brother. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm coming down. David, I, I need you to help me. Yeah, you can come get me. You're gonna have to come up, up and get me. <laughs> you know the signal for that. <laughs> Let's just start down here. I just want you to help me. Sing, sing, Sharon.
Father Jesus on. Hand him back up. Jesus. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. For the power of God that's going through you right now. To invoke a healing and a cure. Top of your head. Lift up your wonderful. Thank you for your presence. Jesus, Lord, we magnify you. We magnify you and lift up your wonderful, gracious name. Lord, we magnify you. Lord, we magnify you. Your wonderful name. And lift up your wonderful name. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you.
sit in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. He is able to do that which we cannot do. to the The sin sick soul. If you cannot preach like Peter and you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus. And how he died for all, for all. There is a balm in Gilead to make all the
Please stand and let's sing that again. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, how I Him all. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Lucy, for sharing your life with us in Him. And we thank you, Keter, for believing Him and teaching us to do the same. We are so thankful for this service today. And as you follow that dove, he takes you different ways. Sometimes there's laughing. Sometimes there's silence. Now we will go in him and return in him at 2.30. In Jesus' name. Be blessed. You will be back this afternoon, will you? Will you be back this afternoon?